I want to thank all of you for being with us today. I want to thank uh, Kathy for welcoming us uh, so warmly. And I really want to thank uh, the extraordinary panelists who I am lucky enough to be in conversation with over the next 40 minutes uh, for their time, uh, their work, uh, their example. And I want to welcome kind of all of them into this kind of virtual space, but kind of a deeply kind of authentic community of all of us who believe that every child um, and those of us that are maybe a little older deserve every opportunity uh, to play sports and to thrive, whether in a pool, on a track, uh, on a field, on a court, on a rink, or kind of wherever else our, our passions and our interests may take us. And so I want to first um, welcome Aaron Vesuvis, who is a professor of law and an expert in Title IX. I want to welcome Mallory uh, Wegman, who I certainly um, have cheered on in the Paralympics, uh, a record-setting two-time Paralympian and now an NBC Sports Analysis. I want to thank uh, Lex Gillette for being with us, um, particularly because we do need kind of men to continue to be in this work with us. Uh, he is an extraordinary Paralympian, a silver medalist, and a thankfully tireless advocate uh, for Title IX. And I want to thank Kim Ng, the general manager of the Miami Marlins. Thank you all so much for being with us today. And Aaron, I hope that we could start with you. Um, while you know, we just saw those kind of important kind of path-breaking, path-creating words on the screen of, of Title IX, I wonder if you could give us just a brief kind of overview of the history of Title IX, and maybe um, along the way you could point out some of the big wins that Title IX has enabled. Yes, yes, yeah, happy to do so. So, you know, Title IX was legislation included in uh, a general uh, legisl legislative effort to make some uh, funding-based improvements to the American educational system. Uh, Congress made that choice back in 1972, and one little sneaky chapter got uh, attached um, to this law uh, that contained a very short sentence about prohibiting sex discrimination in education institutions that accept federal funding. Um, the law got through with very little um, attention paid to that provision and even less paid to its application to athletics. So in a way, it's kind of remarkable that it has been the most enduring part uh, of that law um, and that it is the one that has um, affected so much change. So you asked about some Title IX wins. A few came early on in Title IX's life, lifetime. Um, as the implications for athletics and particularly collegiate athletics became uh, became clear, uh, there were some early political movements to try to limit Title IX's application to sports. Um, Congress had to step in a couple of times and fend off some uh, legislative amendments that were proposed that would have either excluded college sports entirely or at least football from the uh, equity equation. Um, there was, uh, Congress also had to step in uh, to correct uh, a Supreme Court ruling that narrowly read Title IX to only apply to an education institution's uh, particular program that was receiving federal funds. Um, and Congress restored or clarified the law's um, initial intent that if any part um, of a college or university or a school district is receiving federal funds, then the entire institution um, would be responsible for Title IX compliance, not just that program. Uh, so a couple of early uh, legal, uh, legal wins. Um, some additional legal wins came also at the hand of the Supreme Court, which has over the years confirmed that individuals who are victims of discrimination that's prohibited by Title IX can sue the school district or the university for that discrimination. And this is important because it opens up a second avenue of uh, enforcement, that it's not just the government's job uh, to make sure that schools and uh, school districts and colleges and universities are complying with Title IX by holding them accountable through their federal funding, um, but it's also possible for uh, individuals uh, to take on the status of plaintiff um, and uh, participate in that important accountability uh, as well. Um, and then, uh, not to, to round out sort of all, all three branches of government, um, the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, which enforces Title IX, has over the years uh, resisted efforts to, uh, to weaken the law by changing the regulations, which are the details that flesh out that statute's broad language. Um, 
So we can see uh, over the span of Title IX's life uh, some legal or political wins, um, but how does that translate into wins in effect or wins in, in reality? Uh, well, one one thing we're you know we're here to celebrate Title IX, and, and we'll definitely put these wins in context and make sure that it's clear to the audience that there's still more to go. Um, but it is worth pointing out that before Title IX was passed, fewer than 300,000 girls played high school sports. Uh, that increase in Title IX's lifespan has been tenfold. Over three and a half million girls today have that uh, have that opportunity. Um, and that's thanks not just to the uh, legal accountability that Title IX holds schools, colleges, and universities to, but the contribution that it makes to our societal norms and our expectations that uh, equal opportunity in schools is the right thing to do. Um, similarly, at the collegiate level, uh, growth in women's sport, fewer than 30,000 before Title IX, now 215,000. Uh, so another um, exponential um, increase there as well. Uh, Title IX doesn't just require equity in the number of athletic opportunities, but the quality of those athletic opportunities as well. So we've seen wins in uh, litigation and cases that have challenged um, the uh, the unfairness of putting girls sports in uh, in the wrong or non-traditional season in a state that uh, had to split up um, you know boys and girls girls basketball for example because of resources and did that for a number of sports um, but it was always the girls sports that had to play in the unnatural season um, and litigation under Title IX helped correct that uh, Title IX litigation has also been used to ensure the um, equitable quality of athletic facilities like making sure that softball fields um, have lights and a scoreboard and um, uh, dugouts that are of equitable quality to the baseball team uh, at that school. Um, and then outside of athletics participation, Title IX wins in other areas of its application have had effects on uh, athletes uh, and, and, and schools and uh, university athletic uh, programs as well. For example, Title IX's application to sexual misconduct has led to greater protection against sexual misconduct that occurs within the student athlete population. Uh, and there have also been cases where coaches' sexual harassment of players has been successfully challenged under Title IX. Um, Title IX's application to employment discrimination has allowed college coaches to challenge retaliation against them that they receive when they advocate for equal rights for their girls and women's teams. Um, and Title IX's application to LGBTQ rights means that it's not lawful for a coach to have a quote unquote no lesbian policy, um, as some coaches have had in the past. Um, Title IX has also been used to protect the rights of transgender students to use the locker rooms that correspond to their gender identities, which has um, an effect on uh, athletic participation as well. So um, these are some of some of the Title IX wins that I um, think it's important to highlight here today. Great. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, and while certainly we are focused here on, on sports broadly, um, as you point out, it is important for us to acknowledge that Title IX has had an impact uh, well beyond athletics um, at not only the college and the university level, but really kind of throughout someone's educational journey. Um, Kim, I wonder if we could next turn to you. You're the first woman to be a general manager of a major league baseball team. And I wondered if you could kind of share a bit about your story and kind of how, how you reached kind of this extraordinary pinnacle and kind of where or if you felt Title IX um, kind of intersect uh, with that story and where you think maybe Title IX doesn't go far enough. Sure. Um, so uh, every GM's path is a little bit different. Um, we've had GMs in the past who have been former baseball players you know, at the professional level. Um, that model is not as prevalent anymore. Um, and we've had, you know, the other bucket, non-former players who you know, some have has taken a long time, some it's been rather quick. Um, I was definitely in the not very quick bucket. Um, but I was, you know, I did get to the assistant GM level at a fairly rapid rate. Um, I was an assistant GM of the New York Yankees by the time I was 29. So definitely um, a fairly quick rise through the ranks. But 
um, I realized that in order to get to the next step of being a general manager, I, I realized it was going to, I was going to have to take a little bit different approach. Um, you know, it wasn't going to be as easy for me as it, as it had been, or, you know, was for my male colleagues. Um, I had to be really cognizant of the obstacles and per perceptions that only I would encounter, you know, as a woman to get to that next level. And so I was really focused on making sure that my resume covered things that, um, you know, that there would probably be concerns about. So um, minor league player development, um, scouting. And so I, you know, I took the next uh, probably 10 years of my career to, to make sure that I was really focused on that so that there would never be any excuse that, you know, somewhere there was a hole in my resume. Um, I felt like I also had to be a little bit more creative than the guys. Um, my path, you know, I realized was probably not going to be um, the traditional path. And so I actually went to Major League Baseball um, to work for, and I didn't think it would be that long, but I ended up working there for 10 years. Um, and that is something, that is a step that you will not really see um, on many other general managers' um, resumes. They might have started out at MLB, but you don't see them take a step, you know, I would say you know, in some ways a lateral step over to the, the governing body. And the purpose in that really was to um, meet owners, meet owners of clubs, get to know them, um, have them get to know me and develop a comfort level. You know, again, because I was such a novelty. Um, and then, um, you know, ultimately, I think, um, you know, you could call me fairly resilient or you could call me a little dense because I interviewed for this job uh, at least 10 times um, and, and finally locked it down uh, a year and a half ago. Um, you know, I will say that the journey was definitely full of bumps and bruises. Um, you know, whether it was on the on the daily level or, you know, sort of the, the more macro zoomed out level, um, where it took me a fairly long, long time to, to get to this level. Um, you know, I've been in this industry 30 plus years. Uh, you know, I think some, I think, you know, some of the, the counter, my male counterparts who, if they had a resume like mine, it might not have taken them that long. Um, but you know, we are where we are. Um, I will say that the journey has been worth the wait. Um, you know, I've loved just about every minute of, of this job. And, you know, and, and, you know, while I am incredibly grateful, I also realize I, I am very fortunate um, in the opportunities that I did ha have, um, as well as, you know, a lot of um, the help and support I had along the way. Um, you know, in terms of Title IX, um, I, you know, I did a lot of work on Title IX when I was in college, uh, wrote, used it for my senior thesis, and I you know, definitely feel that I was a big product of Title IX, and you know, the generation before me, my coaches, um, my guidance counselors, um, uh, counselors at camp, they were all products of Title IX, and I attribute a lot of my success to Title IX you know, and the role that athletics and sports played in my life and, and helping me gain the confidence that I needed to, the leadership skills, um, teamwork skills that, that I acquired along the way. And um, yeah, just in general, but I think the confidence and, um, you know, the resiliency, the ability to face adversity, and I think just the mental toughness that, you know, this, this 30 years has, has taken on, on for me, um, you know, being able to come back from, you know, nine of those um, interviews where I had to figure out how to get better. And, you know, the one thing about those interviews is that, you know, each time it was, it was very public. Um, and I think that was one of the tougher things to deal with um, is that, you know, your failures were, were out front. And it was there for everybody to see, your family, your friends, others. Um, social media didn't make that easy either. So it was, um, it was a great learning experience, but I do feel like, uh, you know, my, my background in sports, you know, and having grown up an athlete and played at the inter intercollegiate level really helped me get through. It's great. Thank you so much, Kim. I, um, I remember my, my mother, um, being just so excited when I was a kid playing softball and soccer 
um, because when she was a kid, she didn't have those opportunities. And, and yet now when I talk to my daughter, who's seven and starting to play sports, um, she, she can't even imagine that her grandmother like didn't have the opportunities that she had. It is, it is so far beyond how she understands the world and yet is still very important. We've been talking a lot this week about Title IX because um, I just think about what the great Credit Scott King always uh, reminded us that we have to protect and defend progress in every generation. And if we're not aware of the progress, we won't know then it is our responsibility and privilege to help protect that progress. Um, you know, Mallory, I wonder if we can turn to you next with, with a similar question to the one I asked, Kim, could you kind of share your, your journey through sport and kind of how Title IX affected your life? Were you aware of Title IX since you're, um, you're sort of like the next generation of athletes or are you sort of closer to my daughter where you're sort of like, oh, well, I can, I can just do this. Like, this is just the way the world is. You know, Chelsea, I think for me, there was a little bit of that in between, right? I have a mom who very much sport was not accessible in the way that it was for me and my sisters as children. And so knowing that about my mom and asking her as the three of us were athletes as young kids about, you know, did you play sports growing up? And obviously she loved sports, but her access point was very limited as an adolescent. And so, you know, for me, sport was kind of never a question of if, but what. And, and I feel extremely grateful for that. I, I grew up with the socioeconomic status to be able to play sport. I grew up with the access point to be able to play sport. Um, and so from a young age, I've been involved in sport for, for really my entire life. Many of those years have been spent as a competitive swimmer. But when I was 18 years old and paralyzed, that perspective shifted. Because I realized that had I grown up with a disability, that experience would have been vastly different. And so as a young girl in sport, I had access because I did not grow up with a physical disability. I grew up in a zip code that I had the socioeconomic status to have access in our schools. I grew up as a product of Title IX where gender was not, an, not a factor in my access point. But I look at even that version of if I now today was a child with the circumstance I carry at this stage in my life as a woman with a disability, specifically a spinal cord injury and being a wheelchair user and what would my access point look like today if I was a young girl trying to play sport in my community. And I think that's where we see these limitations. We've seen so much progress in 50 years. And, and I am so grateful for that because I am now here 33 years old, still an athlete, do not plan on retiring anytime soon. And I have had a great fortune of opportunity in my career as a female athlete. But to this conversation, there is still more work to be done. And, and I look at it specifically through the lens of where are we advocating for girls with disabilities in adaptive sport programming to make sure that they have an access point? Because we know girls who participate in sports have higher confidence level and self-esteem levels. They get to be a part of a team, which also creates a sense of belonging and takes them away from sometimes factors that can create isolation we know all of the things that sport can provide. And then we look at the disability community at large and we disproportionately face isolation. We disproportionately face battling through mental health and um, lack of confidence and self-esteem and all of these elements that really that really impact the well-being of an individual. And, and we started this conversation talking about how sport truly has the ability to transcend the field of play and also impact industries far and wide outside of sport, most importantly, societal perception of place and belonging. And so I think of how, you know, as a Paralympian, a very proud one at that, how the adaptive sports community can really serve as this catalyst to also change perception in a way that furthers educational opportunities for individuals with disabilities, furthers our employment rates in the disability community, and, and leadership opportunities. And so that's something that I think is kind of from a personal experience where I would say that limitation today, 50 years later, still does exist. And I'm excited about what the next 50 years will look like because we are at a point 
where the Paralympic movement, which by, by nature means also adaptive sport, has more exposure than it's ever had before. And so we're having this conversation in society, we're having the conversation about disability rights and equity. And I think that that is so vital to this next phase of the journey that we are on in Title IX. Absolutely. And um, Lex, I wonder if we can if we can turn to you and if you uh, could please you know, share your story and also um, share why, thankfully, it was important for you to be here as a man in a conversation about Title IX. Yeah, absolutely, Chelsea. Thank you. I think that, you know, I'm I'm originally from Raleigh, North Carolina. And to be honest with you, growing up, I didn't hear much about Title IX. And to give you more context around my my story, my first uh, coach, if you will, was was my mom. She was a, a single parent. And prior to me losing my sight, I can remember many of times where we would go outside and we would play, we would play catch, we would play basketball. My mom is, she's the athletic, she's a part of the the athletes in in my family. They played softball, they played basketball, they played soccer. So all I really knew was seeing her participate in sport. I didn't know anything about there being any inequities around girls and women being able to participate. And even thinking about growing up in the triangle, I love college basketball. And around that time, you heard about the Pat Summits of the world. You heard about the K Yows, and they were incredible, not only incredible coaches who, who were women, but they were just incredible coaches in general. And I remember looking up to them like, these are amazing, amazing human beings. And eventually it got to the point where I did hear about Title IX and the inequities around girls and women within within sports. And so Mal, Mal mentioned a lot of it, but as a person with a disability, there's certainly been a lot of challenges that I have had to face and, and others who live a similar experience as I do. And thinking back to all of the supporters and advocates to, who I've had in my life, I've only felt it right to lend my voice as, as a man to be able to leverage the, the opportunities that I have in my life to be able to lift others up as well and to bring them along. Sport has played a, a huge role in my life. And I have a, excuse me, I have a slogan that is no need for sight when you have a vision. A lot of people read that, see that, and they might think that is specific to those who are blind and visually impaired. But in fact, when I created that, the, the main idea around it is really just challenging us to transcend beyond what our eyes see. And, you know, almost 50 years ago, we had Title IX signed into, into law and someone saw it that we can transcend beyond what is currently going on right now and really push toward that vision of having equitable opportunities for, for all. And that's really where a lot of my, my focus lies. I really want everyone to have these opportunities to participate in sport. And you heard Kim talk about it as well. She, she inter interviewed 10 times. You know, when you step into the field of play, there's so many different things that you that you learn. You learn to persevere. You learn to become a better teammate. You learn those leadership skills. You learn to trust your confidence raises to a higher level. Your self-esteem, it changes. And for all of our all of our girls and women here in in the United States, you know, everyone, you know, I want people to acquire those skills so that they too can become a Mallory Wegman one day, so that they too can become a Kim and, and be a GM in these, these high spaces and places and even beyond the field of play, these skills are crucial to our growth and development as, as human beings. You know, we understand that as an athlete, your shelf life is not going to be forever, but you'll still be able to take those skills 
the things that you've learned within sport to continue life and to continue having a, a huge impact. And I know that um, I learned a ton of that from my mom. I've learned a lot of that from the the, the Billy Jean, Jean Kings of the world and all of these amazing, uh, phenomenal women who participate in sports. And, you know, one day if I have a, a daughter, you know, I'm going to be able to point to these amazing examples and let her know that, you know, you can you can do these amazing things as well. You can be a phenomenal athlete and you're going to learn a lot of skills so that you can be an amazing human being who can go into this world and and continue to carry that baton so that you too can be a, a supporter and advocate for, for those who will come behind you. Amen, Lex. Amen. Um, and if uh, you are blessed with a, a daughter, she will certainly be blessed to have you as her dad. You know, we've we've talked so much now about um, kind of the the progress that Title IX uh, enabled, facilitated, has protected, and you know also Mallory spoke still about some of the work that we need to do. I wonder now if we can shift to the work that needs to be done. And Aaron, maybe we can start again with you and you could share kind of from your perspective, your, your perspective, you know, as a Title IX expert, kind of what additional protections do we need to ensure that every child, whether a cisgender girl, a transgender girl, a non-binary youth, you know, a child with physical disabilities, you know, any, any child could have uh, any opportunity uh, to play sport, kind of what, what is that kind of next generation of legal protections that uh, that we that we need and that our children deserve. Yeah. Well, I can certainly start the ball rolling on this question, but it's uh, such a broad and important question that requires um, everyone's perspective. So I'll, uh, I'll invite my co-panelists to chime in and also for the audience to think about uh, on their own uh, what they see as uh, ways to help move the needle on inclusion uh, and equity in sport. Um, but uh, you asked about policy, and I am a law professor, so that is definitely the place where I uh, where I where I want to start. Um, the thing about our country is that because of the legal system we have and the combination of uh, you know different levels of government, if the if the federal law doesn't go far enough. There is always the opportunity for you know both advocacy to try to improve the federal law, but meanwhile to use state law and to use local law uh, to try to um, help fill in those gaps. Uh, and sometimes what happens is that uh, a state comes up with a good idea and then all the other states copy it. Uh, and so um, I want to single out some examples of state law that have kind of taken Title IX as a starting point um, and uh, issued some improvements on it. Um, and these all happen to come from California. California's definitely taken uh, some leadership in the, uh, you know, let's build and improve on Title IX department. Um, but this is not to say that that's the only state that has these kinds of laws. They are, um, they are copied and, uh, uh, and uh, enacted um, in other states uh, as well. Um, so um, one example from California is a law that extends the gender equity mandate to community and youth sports outside the education context. Um, and that's important because Title IX is an education law. Um, its enforcement is limited to school districts, colleges and universities, and those that receive federal funding. Um, so that leaves out uh, youth sports that are operating outside the ages of any school. Uh, and so to have a state law that says, hey, if you're, if you're going to play, uh, you know, if you're going to run a, 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 city, uh, a city sports league, um, you have to make sure that you're offering equitable opportunities uh, to people of all genders. Um, that's that's an important um, expansion um, of Title IX's power. Um, California also uh, has a law that requires uh, schools to um, allow transgender students to participate in sports according to their gender identity. It's not the only state with a law like that. Um, but for continuity, all my examples are coming from California, so I'm highlighting theirs here. Um, this, this is an important example, uh, an important um, example of a, a state law that improves on Title IX uh, because uh, Title IX doesn't expressly say um, anything about transgender people, although there are certainly emerging interpretations that have been aided by recent Supreme Court cases about transgender rights that open up uh, the um, 
application of Title IX in this regard. Nevertheless, it's helpful to have a state that specifically requires it. And it's such an important counterexample uh, to uh, the number of states who have recently been passing law banning trans girls from playing sports uh, that match their gender identity. Um, California has a law that took effect in 2015 that requires school districts to contribute data about their athletic offerings based on sex to the state. Um, and this is important because it helps provide transparency uh, to those who might be you know, interested, stakeholders, citizens, uh, lawyers, um, watchdogs, um, anyone who wants to see what's going on at the school district level. Um, at the federal level, there's a law like that, but it only, gov it only governs uh, colleges and universities. Uh, and so uh, it is helpful to have that kind of transparency uh, extended um, to states, uh, to, uh, to, to school districts, to the K through 12 level as well. Um, and then uh, California also has a law passed in 2020 that uh, um, promises identical prize money to male and female athletes who participate in sports competitions that are held on state land. Um, and Title IX, because of its application to education, understandably doesn't have anything to do with prize money. Uh, but it is an example of uh, states taking uh, creative uh, approaches uh, to try to fill in some of the other civil rights gaps that uh, uh, would, would, otherwise, uh, would otherwise exist. I think um, <clears throat> even though uh, my examples have all been about the law so far, I think I want to um, also just make sure to acknowledge that change is not just the responsibility of legislatures, of politicians, of people who we don't have direct contact with um, other than perhaps through voting, which is important and which is an important way to help move the needle on equality uh, and inclusion. Um, but there are a lot of things that we can do in our individual capacities and in our local uh, capacities as well. Um, a lot of us, especially if you're here on this call, you're probably connected um, to athletics programs in some way. Um, how are you advocating within those spaces uh, to make sure that attention is being paid to um, gender, race, class, LGBTQ athletes? Um, are your sports organizations um, expanding opportunities that will promote participation in all such ways? Um, one example that I think is that I'll, I'll just call out in particular because it's sometimes overlooked when we talk about um, when we talk about LGBTQ inclusion uh, and included in that uh, umbrella are athletes who uh, might be non-binary. Right? They uh, don't uh, identify as either male or female, and we have a sport universe that essentially adopts just those two categories uh, for participation. So while we must also fight to allow transgender athletes to uh, compete in the category that best matches their gender identity, uh, opening up additional opportunities where all uh, people of all genders can participate without regard to their sex or gender. In other words, some co-ed options on the menu, um, I think is another, uh, is, a, is, a, is a step forward um, that we can take to promote, um, to promote inclusion. Um, things that we can do in our individual capacity, standing up ourselves, offering ourselves as role models. Um, there is a dearth of women coaching in youth sports. Uh, we, there is a tendency to uh, defer to, uh, you know, husbands and fathers uh, playing that role with their kids, which, um, you know, which is great for getting men involved as advocates. It's crucial uh, to Title IX success that everyone takes a stake, uh, a stake in it. Um, and so with appreciation for those fathers and husbands who are out there doing that work, um, if kids aren't getting the idea that moms are also responsible for leadership um, in college athletics, um, it can over time paint a one-sided picture and can start to limit people's impression or, or ideas of what's possible in the future. Um, I think it's also important for people to take responsibility for their for their fandom. <laughs> Who are you going to root for? Are you going to support? Uh, are you going to enroll? Are you going to support? Are you going to give money to your alma mater? Are you going to buy season tickets um, that supports an athletic program uh, that does not have equitable offerings or that has suppressed uh, sexual misconduct? or that has opted out because of uh, Title IX's religious exemption uh, from complying with all facets of Title IX. Um, so I think these are just some examples, not just of engagement on a policy level, but on an individual level as well. Like I said, this is just a start. Um, there's definitely more that can be said. So 
And if others want to chime in, um, it would be great to hear. Um, well, thank you, Aaron. Yes, I, I do want everyone else to chime in. Um, and I certainly um, hope that uh, more, more kids can have role models like Lex's mom. Um, I have a lot of enthusiasm, but not a lot of talent, but I certainly throw a ball and kick the ball around with my children. Um, and um, and we do watch quite an, an absurd amount of, of sports. Um, and uh, one of the iconic moments in our family was, you know, a couple of years ago when uh, my daughter turned to me and said, why is our men's soccer team not as good as our women's? And I said, that's a really good question, Charlotte. Um, Kim, I wonder if we could turn to you, you know, just so you could hopefully kind of share reflections on kind of what, what more you think kind of needs to be done and also what, what is the role of, of professional sports, of professional kind of sports for, for women and, and for men and helping to kind of push us and lead us toward a more equitable future. Right. I think, you know, I think for the four majors in this country, um, we have seen them um, you know, really up their uh, diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, and I can speak, you know, obviously most about Major League Baseball and, and what we've done. Um, just this weekend, we were in New York um, playing the Mets and the Mets had a whole L LGBTQ weekend. Um, and I think, you know, I think for us, you know, as promoters of sports and society and the role that sports plays in society, I think we do have, um, you know, we have an obligation. And I think you know, part of the obligation is education. Um, and, you know, hopefully at some point, you know, giving kids more access and really trying to target, you know, these kids in particular who do not have the access um, like others do. So I really feel like you know, it's something that many of the professional sports organizations can take on, um, you know, either in a concerted way, you know, together as a league or um, individually. Um, and I know that, you know, um, diversity and inclusion is very much um, a pillar that the Marlins, um, you know, really promote. And, um, you know, we do our best to really include people in that space. Kim, do you see um, more women coming up the ranks or kind of whatever you said there are, you know, as many paths to GM roles as there are GMs? Do you see kind of other other women on paths that you think, you know, could enable them to reach a similar position to you in the next, I don't know, 10 years? I do. You know, we, we, we actually um, we just had a young woman named assistant general manager of the Baltimore Orioles. Um, and she was an intern for my department uh, at MLB. So that was you know, definitely a nice um, success story for, for us. Um, I will say that Major League Baseball in the last seven to eight years has done quite a bit in this space. Um, I've served on a number of committees to try and pr promote um, you know, young people of color as well as women um, you know, to, to get these opportunities. What we're seeing now is we're seeing you know, a handful or two of uh, young women in coaching roles. Um, and I mean, not just at the minor league level, but we now have you know, a couple at the major league level, one or two at the major league level. Um, we're seeing them out in the field um, in scouting positions. Um, we're seeing them, as I mentioned, minor league coaching positions, um, front office roles. We're seeing a lot more strength and conditioning um, coaches, as well as trainers, the medical profession. So it's really been, in my opinion, a nice success story for Major League Baseball. Um, you know, they created a fellowship where, where, so when I was with Major League Baseball, we would go out and identify young people of color as well as women so that each club didn't have to do it, right? And so having it all um, centrally focused and doing the legwork for the clubs, because um, we just didn't want... Um, we didn't want there to be any excuses. We didn't want there to be any laziness or complacency, right? So we went out and did all the hard work and basically just had them, you know, pick um, <laughs> you know, which one to two they wanted. So um, that's been a great success story. So, you know, I'm, I'm really hardened. I can tell you another success story here at the Marlins. Um, prior to my getting hired, um, our analytics uh, folks told me that, you know, and STEM is obviously another area that you know we have problem with women in um, but prior to my getting here um, we had 
300 applications one year. Uh, we had one applicant who was a young woman. And that young woman was pressured, you know, was prodded by one of our staff to, to apply. So one in 300. After I was hired last year, um, that number went to 30 out of 100. So, you know, Representation it, matters. Absolutely. And so I think, you know, yeah, if you, if you see it, you can be it. Um, so, you know, lots of small success stories, but, you know, we, we still have a lot of work to do. Yeah, great. Well, thank you, Kim. And I wonder, Lex, if we can turn to you and then we'll give the last word uh, to Mallory. Um, Lex, what, what would you like to see um, kind of us really moving toward for more inclusion in sports, whether we're kind of thinking about, about gender or, or disability or kind of any area where we haven't yet done enough? Yeah, I would just, I'll be brief in saying that as, as a person with a disability, my diagnosis doesn't disable me as much as society does. And so in saying that a lot of it is societal perceptions and, and these kind of, uh, these, these beliefs as to what people can and cannot do and what they should and should not do. And so um, what would be really important and helpful would be for you know myself, other other men, you know, everyone to come to the table and to have an open mind in these conversations. And for me, it was all about people helping me to not only realize my potential, but figuring out a way to unleash that potential into the world. So us being able to come to the table, understanding that we all have something uniquely special to, to offer this world and being able to do everything in our power to to leverage our privilege, our power, to be able to help other girls, women, everyone to see their potential and not only see their potential, but to unleash that potential into the world. Great, thank you. And and Mallory, please, any, any final thoughts of what you would like us to be more focused on for kind of the next generation of, of what, what could be you know, a new Title IX? Yeah, you know, I would love to just echo what Lex just said as well. I think when we have these conversations, we often talk about, you know, DE&I and making sure that we're bringing everybody to the table in the conversation, but disability is more often than not always left out of that conversation. And it's important that we make certain that it's not left out of this conversation because sport is a catalyst and it's a catalyst for how we perceive ourselves. It's a catalyst for how we create perception in society. And it's a place that gives us a sense of belonging. So, you know, I think that's a big piece of it. And the one other thing that I would add to it is on a personal note, I am a female professional athlete. I'm training for what will hopefully become my fourth Paralympic Games. But in this moment in time, I am also simultaneously trying to become a mother who is a female professional athlete, specifically navigating through infertility and IVF. And that is a lonely place on a normal day. Being a female professional athlete makes it increasingly challenging. We still have a lot to do in professional athletics for women in opening the door to allowing there to be a space where we can see female athletes becoming mothers in their athletic careers and supporting that and not having that feel like a career detriment to them. And I think I say that purely because when Kim was talking, we talked about how representation matters and creating that path forward. And I think it's so important for our young girls to know, regardless of the circumstance they carry, they have opportunity before them and they can go be the GM of an MLB sports team. They could go be the CEO of the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee. They could go be a female professional athlete and do that all the way through motherhood and bring their children along on that journey beside them. But the point being that there are options and circumstance, whatever that circumstance might be, whether it's race, whether it's gender identity, whether it's ability, whether it's socioeconomic status, that is not the detriment to their success and the opportunities before them. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you to Lex and to Kim and to Aaron and to Mallory for sharing your stories and your thoughts and your uh, ideas for what more we need to do so that um, we have more role models, candidly, uh, for my 
uh, my children and so that every child can grow up and hopefully be a role model for themselves and their communities and kind of pursuing their, their passions and their dreams, whether in a pool or on a field or um, in a classroom, you know, or, or on a track. Uh, so just thank you all so very much. And I hope that everyone who is joining us now will come back at one o'clock for the next panel, Inclusion and Belonging in Sports. Thank you all so much.